Can you hear me? Am I on? All right. Look at this army of little kitties going out. This is fun. That's the funnest part of this church is the generation that's coming behind. The next generation being raised up. It's so exciting and it thrills my heart to see these kids love class. They love to go. They love to be with their friends. And while they're there, they're learning about Jesus and being built up in their most holy faith. This morning, <clears throat> I've planned and prepared to talk to you all about good works. And through the night and through worship today, it's kind of morphed into something a little different, but not completely unrelated. When I got up this morning and was getting ready for church and had the worship music going and was thinking about what I was going to say and I didn't get to format my notes the way I like to have them formatted. I like bullet points so that I can quickly glance down but yesterday when I was preparing it just all I could do is just write and so my notes are in paragraph form this morning and I don't intend to read to you my sermon okay <clears throat> nobody likes when you can tell someone's reading from the teleprompter, right? <laughs> but I asked the Lord this morning, I went, I went back to what's the purpose? Why am I here today? Why am I in this place today? And I just kind of pondered that and asked the Lord, what's my purpose here today? And he just took me back to a very, very basic place. And um, I believe it's the book of Acts, maybe Ephesians. I might have that wrong. Anyway, in the New Testament church, <laughs> broad. <clears throat> but he, he's talking about pastors and teachers and evangelists and apostles, prophets. And their whole purpose is to build up the believers for the work of their ministry. So I felt very strongly that this morning, the reason I'm here today is to build you up and to help inch you closer to your ministry, to the work of of your ministry that God has for you. I know each of us come in here on Sunday morning with a variety of reasons why we're here. My son comes, I'm just going to be honest, to see his friends. That's the age and stage that he's in. He knows we're here to worship Jesus, but he's driven by relationships. He's driven by the fellowship and camaraderie with his friends that he gets when he's here. And that's okay. But as he ages and matures, he will come in and he will enjoy worshiping the way that we enjoy worshiping. But ultimately, we're all here to worship Jesus. We all know that. That's our lives, every part of our being is meant to worship Jesus every day, every moment, every hour, every nanosecond. We are intended to be worshiping Jesus. Our lives should be worship to Jesus when we're dedicated and surrendered in perfect surrender, like that song talks about. But when we come here on a Sunday morning, sometimes we can be so inward focused on what we've been through in our week I just need to get to the altar. I just need to find healing. If I can just get someone to pray for this, pray for that X, Y, Z. And there's not a whole lot wrong with that. But our heart and our purpose for being here in this place every Sunday is to build us up to go out there. To be encouraged and strengthened so that we can minister and that ministry and that service starts to one another in this room. 
So when we come in on a Sunday morning, we come in with the focus, who can I reach today? This is kindergarten ministry and service right here. This is the easy. If you can't pray with someone on your right or your left in here in this room, it's going to be 10 times more difficult to pray with someone on the street or at the library or in a gas station or a grocery store. This is our training ground. We come in. We worship the King of Kings, and then he stirs things in us, and he opens the door for us to be taught and ministered to, but not for our benefit. And the mature Christian understands that whether I feel fed or not, my food is to serve others <clears throat> my key scripture this morning is Hebrews 10 verse 24 I want to read 23 through 25 though so can we stand for the reading of the word verse 23 says let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. Lord, we thank you for what you want to do in us and through us, God. The day is approaching, Lord, and more and more you're gathering in people into your fold, Father. And you desire to use our hands and use our feet and use our voices and our mouths, Father, to reach that group of people. Lord, I pray that you would work in us today. So that we can do the will of the Father. Sanctify this time together. Sanctify this bread. And bless us as we leave this place this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In preparation for the last couple of weeks, I knew I was going to speak. For me, I get the opportunity, like I get a date on the counter and I get weeks to prepare. Pastor doesn't get that same advantage. So I had the opportunity to think and pray over these things for weeks at a time. And I just kept hearing that scripture, provoke one another to good works. Provoke one another to good works. And I felt it was really important to stop and talk about works. A lot of times in this dispensation of grace that we live in, we rely heavily on the verse that precedes 23, where it talks about you have been saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we've moved away from the idea that works save us. We do not believe in penance here. We don't believe that if you've done something wrong that you have to pay that debt. We believe Jesus paid it all. Amen. You can't walk into a grocery store and rack up a big old bill and say, well, Jesus paid it all. <laughs> can't say that on the phone to the bill collectors, right? But we believe that Jesus paid our debt. He's paid the bills. But that's not where it ends. We get the opportunity to go back and do good works from a totally different perspective. When you're able to do good works without the weight of salvation resting on those good works, it becomes fun. The word budget, 
Who here loves the word budget? Dave, there's a handful of nerds in here that budget brings peace. All right? So Dave Ramsey, he's a financial guru. He's on the radio. He teaches courses. He's got lessons, incredible material. It's really basic stuff. It's the stuff your grandma probably lived by, but um, modern day American culture of live it up, buy, spend all your money now, has forgotten those old ways. But anyway, he said there's, there's the nerd and the free spirit. <clears throat> and the nerd loves the budget. Dave is the nerd. <laughs> Gabe is the nerd. They love the budget. They love to sit down and talk about the budget and get all the money in the little boxes and everything fits in a neat place and and we have we have our money set aside for lemonade and then we have our money set aside for um, pizza and every dollar has a box we've got blow money and it's a specific amount like it's got a box and then there's the free spirits and the free spirits are like Meh, let the chips fall where they may. The checking account, my app says I have $300 right now, so clearly I can afford those new kicks, right? The, the shoe drop. That is all the rage these days. <clears throat> but then the next day comes, and you're like, oh, wait, I need to eat too. I do not have eggs or bread or potato chips or anything in my cabinet, and now I can't eat these shoes. <clears throat> but the idea of a budget, some people, for, for most, it is oppressive. They're like, we're going to put you on a budget, and, every, and it's like, mm. <laughs> that means I'm poor. <laughs> Here's, let me let you in on a secret. Every human being on this planet, whether they like it or not, is living on a budget. The richest of the rich tells their money where to go. And so this idea that budget is for those who are on limited funds, everyone's on limited funds to some degree, but this idea that budget is for those who are on limited funds can be a really oppressive concept because what it does is it shows you, a lot of times, just how little you have. Or sometimes it shows you where, how short you're going to fall on this month's expenses. And sometimes it's just too hard to look at. Sometimes it's just too hard of a pill to swallow to say, oh, you mean to tell me? that I don't have the money to go to Starbucks three times a week. As funny as that sounds, that can be painful. Because we like to think, I live in America. I am blessed. I have a job, and I deserve to be able to spend $6 on a coffee. It's just $6, right? But to be told no as a grown-up, to have a piece of paper, a budget, an app, whatever, your checking account tell you no. As adults, we are unpracticed in the art of hearing no. Children, we raise our kids. If you don't teach your child to be okay with hearing no, you have big problems. I mean, we're talking like basic problems. And then you become an adult, and you don't hear no as much. You know, occasionally your boss will say, no, you can't have that day off. Okay, you know, that happens. But for the most part, you get to guide and choose your, all your decisions, what you're going to eat in the morning. You don't have a grown-up telling you what, what you're going to eat, when you're going to eat, and how you should eat it. Children do. So they've got this ability, this, these muscles that are accustomed to hearing no, unlike grown-ups. So this idea of a budget, when you live on a budget, it can be hard because a lot of times it shows you how much you don't have. But when you get to a certain place and your income reaches a certain point and all of your basic needs are covered and then you have a surplus, 
that's when budgeting becomes fun because you begin to get to dream with your money. You, beget, you get the opportunity to say, ooh, I can put $1,000 here, and in one year, it can become $1,100 if you put it in the right place. You get the opportunity to say, you know what, I think I would like to go into real estate investing. So I'm going to buy this house at $30,000. I'm going to put $20,000 into it, and I'm going to sell it for $100,000. That is fun. That's fun money. That's fun budgeting. Well, I want us to think about works from this perspective. When we try our best to earn our salvation, and our ticket into heaven, it's like living on a budget that's never enough, where the dollars and cents never add up. And that is complete oppression. Every time you go to serve in this capacity or you try your best to control your impulses and not sin, you're reminded, I'm not good enough. I don't measure up. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, not of work. You've been saved, but not of your works. Because your works never measure up. Never enough. So what Jesus did was he brought us to the place in our budget where all of our basic needs are covered. Everything, every need we could ever have, he supplied. He's paid the bills. He's dealt with the debt collectors. He's dealt with the medical bills. He's called the hospital and said, you don't owe, they don't owe this money anymore. I've paid it. And so guess what now we get to do? We have the opportunity to live in the surplus of good works. So now, when we put out good works, it's an investment that doesn't drain your bank account, but in time will build it up higher. Every ounce, every moment, every bit of service that you put into the kingdom of God is fun money, and it is going to grow, and you're going to see an increase on it, and you're going to see a harvest. Sometimes tenfold, sometimes a hundredfold. But when you invest into the kingdom of God through good works, it reaps a harvest. That word works in the Greek in, in this Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That word works means a deed that carries out an inner desire. So when we pursue good works, they should be happening because of a deep-seated inner desire to fulfill the will of God in Christ Jesus for our lives. I want to find this scripture really quick. I'll get, I'll get to it later, but... Um, here it is, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You are created for good works. But you're not created to believe and feel that those good works would save you. Good works are an outflow of spiritual growth. They happen. So one of the things that I like to think about with this scripture is provoke one another to good to fruit. Like push one another to produce. Push one another to grow up in the Lord. Push one another to spiritual maturity. That word provoke can also mean irritate. Irritate one another to good works. Irritate one another to fruit. Rub 
shoulders with one another. Let iron sharpen iron. When we become isolated and segmented in our little independent islands that we try to live on, we're not, there's no friction. There's no provoking that can happen. There's no drawing out inside of us the things that God has specifically purposed us to do. If we have been created for good works, what that means is that we have got to allow ourselves to be put in the position to produce good works. And sometimes that position is painful and uncomfortable. It's friction. It's irritation. It doesn't feel good. It forces you to let go of your pride. I think one of the greatest hurdles to people fulfilling their call is pride. Pride will keep you from receiving your healing because you don't want anyone to know that you're weak. You don't want anyone to know that you've fallen short. It'll keep you from receiving deliverance. Pride will keep you from ministering to somebody else because all you're doing is focusing on yourself. We have got to mature as a people of God. That scripture says, exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. This was written thousands of years ago and they were expectant and they were sitting on the edge of their seat and they were passionately doing good works and spurring one another on to good works because they knew the day of the Lord was coming. That was 2,000 years ago. How much more do we need to have that sense of urgency provoking us and pushing us to rub shoulders with one another, to get in the mix with one another, like when rocks come into a bin and they, they tumble them together and the rocks become soft and smooth. We've got to get in this thing together, y'all. We have got to let ourselves be exposed to one another. We've got to be okay if, if someone knows our mess, if someone knows where we blew it. Because nobody's perfect. When we think about plants, fruit is typically an indication of the plant's maturity. So if a plant, if a fruit tree gives you fruit, it means it has reached the point of maturity where it can do that. There are some trees, like I think it's the avocado tree, that can take up to 10 years to reach the level of maturity where it's capable of producing fruit. And that's if all the conditions are good. If you're not producing fruit and you've been walking with the Lord for a long time, you need to confess that to somebody. Because we need to figure out what's happening in your spiritual growth that's keeping you from reaching the level of maturity where you're capable of producing fruit. Trying to produce fruit on your own, if it's not happened naturally in your spiritual walk, if you try to produce it on your own, that's works from the indebted standpoint. That's you're trying to do something that only God can do in you. The writer here in Hebrews, we don't know who the writer is. A lot of people have different speculations about who this writer is. And we don't even really know the group of people that he's talking to. But we know it's a group of seasoned people because they have knowledge of the Old Testament. The way he speaks to them, we know they have knowledge of the Old Testament and its history. So they're probably Jews that have studied this for years and years who have had to live by sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. But he knows he's talking to a group of mature people. But this concept is new to them. It's fresh bread. Good work should be an outflow of a heart that is actively growing. 
in Christ. Good works that are put on, that are fake, that are not a product of a life that's spiritually active and growing is basically what the Pharisees were. Can we be real? Jesus told the Pharisees that they were whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. So basically, you look all nice and shiny on the outside, but you are nasty on the inside. Dead men's bones, no life, not growing, not going anywhere. You're shined up, you're polished up, but it's worthless. There's a, I like the movie Moana. Anybody else here like the movie Moana? Nobody's raising your hand. Okay, I got a couple right here. Be honest, people. Get, get over your pride. If you like it, raise your hand for crying out loud. <laughs> what, do I, what was I just talking about? Let's be mature. Admit it. When I was pregnant with Simeon, I had a great deal of, of pain that I dealt with every single day. I had, um, he lived right up here is where he decided to put all of his big self just on this side. And it messed up my ribs, and it, it, it messed up a nerve in my belly. So it constantly felt like someone had a match just right there on my stomach. And so I'd come home at the end of a work day just tired of holding my body up. And every night I would come, and I would crawl into bed, and I would turn on Moana. <laughs> and I'd watch this because I was pregnant with him in the winter. And I would watch this. Uh, these beautiful scenes, these lovely warm colors. The skies were blue and not gray. And it just, it just had a calming effect for me, and so I grew to really like this movie. But there's this character in there called Tamatoa. Anybody know who Tamatoa is? He's this big crab. I mean, he's massive. And his whole thing is looking good on the outside. He willfully admits that his mama may have told him to be who you are on the inside, that it's what's on the inside that counts, but no, I want to be shiny. <laughs> Stretch your stuff, he says. And he's got all these prizes that he's stuck on himself from years of crawling on the seafloor and all these wonderful things. But that's exactly what Jesus was warning against. Like, we take good works and we, like, stick them to our shell, stick them on our back because they're so shiny. And they look good. But on the inside, we don't really care about really growing. We just want people to think that we're looking good, that we're producing fruit. You see, something that I find super interesting is that spiritual gifts are a gift. They're not necessarily an indicator of spiritual maturity. Fruit is. So you can be gifted with a spiritual gift, and you can operate in a spiritual gift, and not necessarily be producing fruit. So if someone gets up and gives a word of exhortation or gives a prophetic word in a, in a setting, may not always mean, like a lot of times we think, oh man, they are tight with God. They hear from the Lord. But what matters is the fruit of their life. Are they nice to people when they go out in public? You know how many times I've heard stories of preachers that are really well known and they've got this beautiful persona and they're cranked on smile and they're just preaching the word of God and they're revelating and exegeting and all these things and then someone puts on Facebook a report of how awful they treated somebody in the line at the airport. There's a, a, a author that I, I like to follow on 
uh, Instagram, and I've read a couple of his books. His name's Bob Goff. And he's a really eccentric guy. But he's made it his life focus to love people well. To do all the crazy things to show people love. And so his daughter had been attending school as a young person, and the teacher was talking about how everyone carries this pretend pail around. And we can either deposit positive things into their pail, or we can withdraw from that pail and make them feel empty. Well, Bob Goff, being the eccentric guy that he is, he wanted to really get this concept deep in his spirit. He goes and buys a physical pail. And for like a month straight, he carries this pail around with him everywhere he goes. Now, mind you, he's a speaker. He travels on airplanes. He goes places. He speaks to people. And I'm not kidding you. He goes to a speaking engagement, and he brought the pail up on the stage with him, puts it on, doesn't mention to anybody what the pail is, never addresses the pail in his speaking, finishes his sermon, picks up the pail, and exits the stage. But he carried that around because he knew he had an issue with impatience. He was very impatient with people. And he knew that his ability to be impatient could steal from people's pale, could make people feel less than, could make people feel um, uh, like they're a burden to him. And if he wanted to love people well, he had to fix that. He had to get some self-control over that impatience. So he carried this pail around. Well, he finishes his speaking engagement, and he's got to get right in the uh, rental car, get back to the, the airport so he can hop a plane and go home. He gets his pail. He buckles it in the seat next to him in his rental car, and he takes off for the airport and st- sits in line at the rental car return. And he's waiting. And he's waiting. And if you've ever flown, you know that they don't hold planes for one person. Like, oh, so-and-so's not here yet. Maybe we should wait on them. No. It upsets the whole apple cart if they delay their flight, right? So he's knowing he's on limited time here, and he's just trying. He's looking at the pail. He's like, trying to be patient, but you're staring at me here. So he finally gets up, gets to the rental car return turns his keys in. Well, now he's at the rental car counter to get paid out, get his receipts and all this stuff. And so he's standing there and he's just waiting, waiting, waiting. And the time for his flight comes up on his watch. And he's like, I just missed my flight. (laughs) Happy joy, joy, right? And so he's trying to be really patient with the guy that's checking him out the rental car counter. And the guy's just talking about all these different things. He's just really taking his time and and being just the best customer service rep he could possibly be and asking him questions about his stay and his time in California and all this stuff. And the whole time he's holding his pail and he's like, please just shut up. (laughs) Finally, the guy finishes his paperwork, sends him on his way, and Bob goes to walk off. And the guy goes, oh, Bob, I just wanted to say, I really appreciated your sermon this morning. Can you imagine if he had lost his cool like he had been known to do at that rental car counter, the impression that it would have left on that person? That's what I'm talking about, good works. Good works may not mean serving at the soup kitchen every Friday night. Good works may be just as simple as not losing your cool in traffic or not losing your cool in the rental car counter when you're missing your flight. Good works are reflecting Jesus 24-7, 365, because there's a world that's hurting and broken that has seen it done wrong so many times. We have so long lived with a poverty mentality when it comes to our faith. 
And the poverty mentality is based solely on scarcity. We live our lives in a constant state of, I am not enough. I don't have enough to give. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough mental bandwidth. I'm too stressed. I'm overworked. I'm underpaid. These are all concepts of scarcity. And the poverty mentality, what it does is you become so locked into that because you've lived that way for so long that even when you come to a place where you've got an abundance, you still live by those rules. Here's a definition. A poverty mentality is one that influences behaviors with consistent beliefs that money should not be spent, opportunities are limited, any risk at all is dangerous, any success is temporary and non-replicable, and generally remaining in the back of the pack is safest. So you're constantly looking for the best deal. You will drive 30 miles to save 10 cents on a gallon of gas. Opportunity costs are lost on a person that lives in the poverty mentality. In God's economy, there is no poverty. There are no limits to what you are capable of when you when God is working through you the Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels a vessel is a pass-through now an earthen vessel would have been a pot that they filled up and they dumped and they filled up and they dumped and it was filled up so that it could be poured out and it was filled up again so that it could be poured out a lot, but in our body, a vessel is a tube. It's like a pipe. And there's constant flow running through, constant running through. We are vessels. And there is no limit to what he can pour through you, the money that he can pass through your hands, the love that he can circulate through your mouth and through your eyes and through your arms and your heart. There is no limit no budget to good works. No longer do we live a life impoverished of sin and bound by scarcity, but we've received an abundance of life through Christ Jesus. We receive and give and receive and give and receive and give and it never stops and it never will and it never should we are a vessel that he passes through and there is no there are no limits in acts chapter 3 peter was confronted with this man in front of the temple and he's asking for gold silver money whatever they could give peter says silver and gold have i none Peter was not focused on what he did not have. He made a simple statement of fact, but it was only to magnify the next sentence. But such as I have. And what he had was far greater than any diamonds or golds or silver coins. And it was limitless. He knew if he put a coin in that man's cup, it would be gone the very next day. But what God had empowered Peter with was so limitless that when he poured it out on this guy, it made a forever difference. It made a forever change. And guess what started in that man's life? That man's ability to be a vessel, to be a limitless uh, supply of God's power and goodness. We need to begin to invest the fruit of our life like there's... No limit to how much of it we have. 
somebody that's budget is $14 billion doesn't care if they spend $100 on a pair of tennis shoes. It doesn't matter. They're not even thinking about the dollars and cents of it. They don't care how much it costs. They're going to give it. If someone needs a laptop, it's nothing for them to say, I can give you a laptop. We should live our lives. I'm not talking about money. We should live our lives in such a way that that's our mindset about what we have to give. Such as I have, give I thee. You need help, you need wisdom. Well, in my brain, I don't know how to fix it, but guess what? I'm tapped into the author of wisdom. I'm tapped into the source of wisdom. Such as I have, I have him. I give him to you. And in that way, I'm giving you wisdom. I'm giving you peace. I'm giving you joy. I may not know what to say, but I can pray Jesus over you. I can speak the name of Jesus over you. Such as I have, give I thee. And what he has and will pour through me is without limit. We have an assignment here on earth. So many people on this planet struggle with assignment. What is my purpose? Why am I here? If you don't know that you belong on this planet, the enemy is going to fight you tooth and nail for your life. He's going to seek to keep you so beat down and so oppressed that you make zero difference. Our assignment, we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. We were created to be a vessel that he can work through. We were created to be on this earth to serve others. Somebody on this earth needs you. Period. You may not know who it is. You may not know how they need you. You may not know why they need you, but they need you. It's an old song that says, I want to be a vessel you work through. I want to be more like you, Jesus. Lord, make me more like you so that I can be that vessel. Mature me, Lord. Let that be our prayer. God, mature me so that I can produce fruit that can feed this world. God, mature me. Purify my vessel so that you can flow through me so that I can be functioning in my assignment and I can function in my call. If you don't know your assignment, if you don't know the ministry that God has called you to, forget figuring out and just start serving. Serve, period. I don't care if you're greeting at the door. I don't care if you're picking up tissues on a Sunday after church. I don't care if you're just wiping off water bottles when we hand them out at the parade. Doesn't matter. Serve, serve. Go to somebody's house and mow their lawn. Serve. Go to your neighbor's house, knock on the door, and take them a candle. Serve people. Love people. Every opportunity you get. Every time an opportunity to serve a person, an individual is presented to you, take it. Invest it like there's no limit. Invest your time, your talent, your treasure. I'm not saying to drain your resources. I'm not saying to drain your physical ability, your physical self. Give of what God has placed inside of you, such as I have, give I thee. Now, I'm not going to stay up all night every night, get on Facebook and find every person with every problem and type scriptures all night long to people to encourage them. I'm not talking about that. But the opportunities, when you're walking with Christ, the opportunities will come to you. And when you, are, you have matured to the place in the spirit, you will know. You will flow in this so seamlessly. And when you give out of your spirit man, you will feel no deficit. 
You will be enriched. You will be refilled. Titus 2, 11 through 14, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So we all have this opportunity to live limitless because this grace of God has been given to all. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. It's possible to live godly in this present age. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We, we talked about being in the waiting. The reason we wait is for the hope that's set before us. Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify us for himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. So when you come into the family of God and you are purified and you are washed with the blood, you become zealous for good works. You desire to be a vessel that he can work through. John 13, 35 says, by this all will know. In the Greek, all, that word all means all right? All means all. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another. And what does that love look like? Service. Jesus, when he was with his disciples for the last supper, what did his love look like to them? service he showed his love to judas in another way confronted sin peter he confronted him sometimes love looks like that it's all service it's all serving but he knelt before his disciples wrapped a towel around his waist and he served them washed their feet i read a book one time it's called let your life speak and this guy was a Quaker, and he had a friend who was in a very deep and lonely and dark depression. They wouldn't leave their house, couldn't go anywhere, lonely, sad, empty. And what he felt like God laid on his heart to do was to go every day to this person's house and wash their feet didn't say anything he didn't do anything else he just did the one thing that he felt God calling him to do and he washed their feet he loved them what a beautiful expression of love there was nothing he could do to fix this guy's problems there's no pill he could give him no answers he could give him to satisfy because he's dealing with the spirit we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but acts of love drove that spirit out. They will know you are my disciples by your love one for another. Love is active. Love is moving. Love is doing. Love is is serving love isn't just a mental state or an emotion love is an ability we have all got to come to the place where we are so others focused that our love puts shoes and socks on and gets up and gets moving love one another in very obvious ways, love one another in tangible ways, serve one another. I'll never forget, there was a lady who visited our church, and she had a lot of mental issues and disabilities and um, 
couldn't really function as a, a quote unquote normal human being. But my mom was sick and couldn't come to church that Sunday. That afternoon, we get a knock on the door, and this lady had brought a box of tissues. It's all she brought. It's probably all she could give. But it was an act of love, and it meant a lot. God can use anyone and anything to show his love. We need to become more and more mindful every day of how we can show love, of how our love can go, and how our love can be expressed. Maybe you need to carry a pail around because you have a tendency to do or say something that makes others feel discouraged, that steals from people's wells. I do it. I think we're all guilty of it in some way, but God wants to purge that from us and cleanse that from us. If the musicians would come. I want to finish with Matthew 6, 19 through 20. You guys can stand, please. says do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal every good work that you perform on this earth it is laid up as treasure in heaven. And our earthly minds likes to think of treasure as crowns and jewels and a big treasure chest that we have in heaven. But the older I get and the more people I lose to death, the more treasured heaven becomes. So what if treasures are souls? Lay up for yourselves souls in heaven. Invest in people's lives so that somebody makes it to heaven because they met you, because they crossed paths with you. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, again in the Passion this time it says so now wrap your heart tightly around the hope that lives within us that hope gets people to heaven knowing that God always keeps his promises discover creative ways to encourage others and to motivate them toward acts of compassion doing beautiful works as expressions of love This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together as some have formed the habit of doing. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that day dawning. Wrap your heart tightly around the hope. Because when we grip so tightly to that hope and we understand fully that that is our only hope and just how limitless and how full that is you will never meet a person on the street that you feel unequipped to minister to because you have the hope says discover creative ways so this week I want to give you an assignment I want you to think of somebody that needs encouragement I want you to come up with a creative way 
to serve or to love them. It doesn't have to involve money. Actually, it's more creative if it doesn't. Consider the most creative way that you can love that one person this week. Start with one. Get our eyes off of ourself. It gives you the opportunity to look at somebody else's problem instead of your own. If the enemy can keep us looking at our own problems, he keeps us from looking around and seeing who we can serve and who we can love. I'm not saying neglect your problems or let your house fall apart. I'm saying don't dwell on your own problems. Know your problems. Admit your problems. But know that God's got it. And know that if you will serve and you will love, he will take care of it. He will take care of the rest. I don't have anything else. Looking more like you. You did your part. I want to be more like you. Sing it. Lord, I want to be more like you. vessel. I want to be a vessel you work through. I want to be more like you. Lord, I want to be more like you. Lord, I want to be more like you. I want to be a vessel you work because we think that you all don't already get this. We are here to remind you of who you are and what you have. So I hope that you will be encouraged this week and be built up for the work of your ministry. You have a ministry. Understand and realize it and go into this earth empowered. Go into your week and your workplace empowered with the hope. I love you guys so much. We've got prayer here on Wednesday night. We want you to come and join. Serve your brothers and sisters in prayer. That's right. Do you have something? Yes, please. Give Jesus a hand. Isn't his word powerful? Amen. Thank you, Lindsay. Amen. Woo. We're going to get anything we need to get this right here. This is, this is the meat. Thank you, Lindsay. Powerful revelation and delivery of the word that I need, the word to quicken our spirits. And I want to, as the covering um, of this house, God has placed me here to, to cover. And there's a lot of sickness, physical sickness, that's been attacking our community, our body, and sitting at home today watching us online. We know you're there. Yes, yes, yes. We know you're hurting. We love you if you And we Jesus. believe in healing. 
We believe in a God that is greater than disease, sickness, infection, flus, and viruses. Amen. We love you, Dee Dee. We're praying for you. And we have a, a urgent request. Patty Harris. Many of you know Patty Harris. She is in intensive care, in critical condition, in the hospital, and needs a touch of the Lord. They had to put her on a ventilator due to pneumonia and some viral issues that are going on with her. And we believe God. Amen. She's going to come off of that ventilator. Amen. And we declare healing in the name of Jesus. Take someone by the hand and let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come against every disease, a sickness, and affliction that would come against the body of Christ, that the people of God who are at home today would be up and well and free and out to do and to serve and to give fully healthy and strong. We de declare divine health unto them. You, we declare the immune systems are strong. We declare every curse that is brought upon us uh, in this season uh, is driven back seven times uh, from the way that it came. Yes. And he will restore and repay to the body of Christ everything that has been taken and stolen. We declare healing over our friend Patty. We believe yes. you, Lord, Thank that you, you breathe life into those lungs. Uh, that you drive out the infection and that her blood circulate and flow freely because there is an abundance of healing. There is no shortage of virtue. Let it flow to her in the power of the Holy Ghost that lives in her, overcoming everything the enemy has plotted against her in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We declare healing over Casey and Rachel Welch and their children and their household. It is a redeemed household. It is an anointed household. And they are healed. And the power of the Holy Ghost is moving in them right now. According to the word of God, rise and be healed in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Now I have an assignment for us. Some of us do uh, lit this time of year. We're well into that. And right in the middle of that is 21 days that we as a church are going to commit to prayer. So March 1st to March 21st is going to be 21 days of prayer, unity, for what God is about to do here in this revival and specifically expanding our building and our space. Every part of our ministry is overrun. Our children's classrooms, our choir room, our platform is running over each other. And on a normal Sunday, if you get here late, you have to pull up a folding chair and uh, it's getting more and more and more difficult to get everybody in their place. So God has given us a plan and a vision to add on. And we will see God perform the miraculous here as he has so many times in the past. And I can tell you he's already providing. Things are already happening. Some of you have already committed and you're giving toward a building fund because you know how desperately this needs to happen. We have new people coming every week continuing to commit and uh, be a part of this ministry. So for 21 days, March 1st through 21st, those 21 days, we will be praying about how God will provide for this building and how we can be part of that commitment. On the 23rd, or is it the 24th? I always get that mixed up. Sunday, whatever day that is. I think it might be the 24th. Sunday, the 24th of March, which is Palm Sunday, we're going to do a 3D presentation of our new facility on this screen for you to view. And we're going to give you an opportunity to put a, a card 
of commitment together as we have done in years past. And on Easter Sunday, we're going to receive the first building fund offering for our new facilities. So we're going to add probably 12,000 square feet of classrooms, sanctuary space, choir space, meeting rooms, classrooms, all this kind of stuff. Bunch of good stuff. So I'm excited about that, and I know you are, and we're going to see it through. So let's get ready for your email. You'll get a link to connect to commit to prayer on the, your email. It'll probably come later in this week. So you'll be ready to sign on and tell us what days and what times you're going to be praying for our building project. All right? So, one more thing. One more thing. This week, some workers are going down, have you already said this, to Lexington, to Nicholasville, to, to add a nursery to our River, Kentucky campus. Amen. And last week... An offering came in for $1,000 with a challenge for anybody who would be willing to give $1,000 and go ahead and get that $6,000 collected that you announced that we needed. The first $1,000 came in last week, so they were just wanting everybody to know. No names, but who else wants to give 1000 to see it happen? Thank you. Amen. So we will get that nursery built uh, this week, and we'll, we'll show you some pictures. How's that? I love y'all. Enjoy your lunch. We'll see you Wednesday night at 7 right here for prayer.